Welcome back. So today we're going to introduce a language for talking about computation on meshes. And the beautiful thing about this language is that all the words we use in this language are exactly the same as the words we used in the continuous mathematical setting, except that we prepend the word discrete to a bunch of them. So for instance, before we had differential forms, now we're going to have discrete differential forms. By the way, this parallel structure of language is not always something you have when you move between different disciplines. When you go between mathematics and computer science, or physics and engineering, often what you'll find is that people have come up with different words, different terms for exactly the same idea and concept. And it can take a lot of work to untangle this equivalence and really establish you know, if I'm a physicist, what is the engineer saying? If I'm a computer scientist, what is the mathematician saying? And so having this kind of parallel structure between these two worlds is actually really powerful because it lets you move very fluidly between talking about continuous mathematics, continuous geometry, and translating some deep and rich ideas into algorithms. In the other direction, it becomes that much easier to take some tough computational problem you have and communicate it to somebody who has a mathematical background. So the moral of the story is that by always working hard to find precise translations between different domains, you can open up a whole lot of new possibilities. Just to review what we did in the continuous setting, we introduced this idea of exterior calculus. And exterior calculus is the calculus of differential forms. We learned to differentiate them and integrate them and so forth. As a review, let's try solving, just not using a computer, but just using kind of pen and paper, a basic equation involving differential forms. So in particular, let's say we're given this constant two form, omega, equal to dx wedge dy. And let's say we're in two dimensions. Okay, and all I want to do is find a one form alpha whose derivative is equal to omega. Sounds pretty easy. Compute the antiderivative. This is something that you've done, for instance, in your intro calculus class. Okay. So how do we do this? What's a good starting point? Well, one thing we could do is we could remember that every one form alpha can be expressed in coordinates as u dx plus v dy for some pair of functions u and v. Okay, so that means the derivative of alpha becomes, well, the derivative of u wedge dx plus the derivative of v wedge dy. Of course, the derivatives of dx and dy are both zero. Okay, and also remember an important fact about the wedge product dx wedge dy is equal to minus dy wedge dx. If we change the order of the wedge product, we're changing the orientation of our two form. So we can also write omega like this. We could say omega is minus one half dy wedge dx plus one half dx wedge dy. Same thing. Okay, so if we want these two things to be equal, d alpha and omega, then we kind of know now what u and v must look like. It must be that du is equal to minus one half dy, and dv is equal to plus one half dx. More explicitly, that means u must take the form minus one half y plus a. Why is that? Well, okay, if we differentiate this function u, we get minus one half dy plus d of a constant, which is zero. And in fact, these are the only functions whose derivative looks like minus one half dy. Likewise, v must look like one half x plus b for some constant b. Okay. In other words, we know that alpha looks something like this. Looks like one half x plus a dy minus y plus b dx for some constants a and b. So I've plotted what that looks like for a and b equals zero. Okay. Is this what you expected? Right. We started out with something constant, omega is constant, and we said, what's a thing whose derivative 
whose exterior derivative is constant. Is that the picture you had in mind? I mean, I think it seems kind of unexpected, right? Omega is constant, but yet alpha has some kind of interesting behavior swirling around a point. There's kind of a special point, and yet it doesn't really matter where that center point lives in the plane. If we move this swirling vortex around, we always get this constant two form. Okay, so the point of this example really is to say that actually solving even very easy differential equations by hand can be unintuitive, hard, unexpected, right? Imagine we, imagine we tried to do anything more complicated than just solve the derivative of something equals constant, right? This becomes complicated very quickly. And moreover, if we want to solve problems that involve any kind of measured data, right? Let's say our domain is not R2, but our domain is some complicated geometric object. Well, then you can forget about trying to solve these equations by hand. Right? There's no way I'm going to solve for a closed form solution of a differential equation on the bunny, right? if I want to solve fluid flow or something. Okay? So the point here is that we really need to use computation if we hope to approximate solutions to interesting partial differential equations. Okay? And that's kind of why we want to translate our continuous language into the discrete setting. So how are we going to do it? How are we going to do this translation? Well, as always in discrete differential geometry, we need to say for each object we have in the continuous setting, what is its corresponding analog in the discrete setting? In this case, what we're going to do is replace our domain with a mesh. So if our domain is this bunny rabbit, okay, we replace that maybe with a simplicial three complex, a manifold simplicial three complex, or a tetrahedral mesh. Right? And we are going to work with an oriented simplicial complex. That's going to be very important, not just an ordinary simplicial complex. We're going to replace this idea of differential forms, which was a fairly complicated idea, with just values on this mesh, something very simple. So in particular, a differential k-form is going to be encoded by just storing numbers on each oriented k-simplex of our mesh. Okay? And finally, differential operators, like the exterior derivative and the Laplacian and so forth, are going to be replaced by sparse matrices. Okay? By finite dimensional linear operators. So, for instance, we'll see that the exterior derivative is captured by signed incidence matrices. Okay, so hopefully in this lecture and the next lecture, a lot of these pieces are going to start coming together. Right, we talked about meshes and oriented simplicial complexes, and then we talked about all this exterior algebra, exterior calculus stuff. We saw these kind of foreshadowing of, well, orientation keeps showing up, k-dimensional subsets keep showing up. What exactly is the connection? That's what we're going to see today. Things are going to come together beautifully. In smooth exterior calculus, we saw that there are lots of different operations you could play around with. We saw the wedge product, the Hodge star, the exterior derivative, the sharp, the flat, and there's more that we didn't even mention. In the discrete setting, it's going to turn out that perhaps the most commonly used operations are the discrete exterior derivative and the discrete Hodge star. That's going to enable us to implement a lot of the algorithms and applications we're interested in. We'll also mention some other things like the discrete wedge product. These discrete operators, of course, will no longer be applied to continuous differential forms, but rather, well, discrete differential forms, values stored on oriented K simplices. And this whole setup kind of corresponds to a standard idea in mathematics about simplicial chains and simplicial cochains and simplicial homology. So there are a lot of rich tools that we'll be able to draw on there. At the end of the day, if you just want to do computation on meshes and kind of forget about all the mathematics, the setup is actually extremely simple. So we're going to have some very basic matrices defined on a mesh. For instance, diagonal matrices storing basic geometric quantities like areas and length ratios. And the signed incidence matrix that we talked about in our original lecture on meshes.
once you build these simple matrices, well, it's nice because you can build up more and more complexity, more sophisticated operations by just composing or multiplying these matrices. So from these elementary building blocks, you can handle a lot of complexity. You can deal with all sorts of differential operators, you can work on curved surfaces, you can work with vector value data, and so forth. In particular, remember that we can describe the gradient in terms of the exterior derivative of a zero form. We can talk about the curl in terms of the Hodge star and the exterior derivative on one forms, right? And the divergence and the Laplacian all have similar kinds of decompositions. And we get operations beyond just the ones from ordinary vector calculus, like how do I compute the Laplacian on a differential k-form on a curved manifold? Right? What does that even mean? Well, this is something that is just trivial to express using the composition of these basic matrices. So the basic recipe now for implementing a lot of algorithms in geometry processing and simulation and so forth is you load up your mesh, you build a few very basic matrices, you compose them, and then you solve a linear system. Okay, and then maybe do something with that data. To understand how this works, we need to think a little bit about two basic operations that translate between the continuous and the discrete setting. One is discretization. So if I start out with a continuous object, how do I turn it into a finite or discrete collection of measurements? Discretization means get a finite amount of information about my continuous object. Interpolation goes the other direction. Given a discrete object, given those finite samples, how do I come up with a continuous object that agrees with or interpolates that data? Okay. And this is easy to think about, for instance, with just a curve in the plane. If I have a continuous curve, I might just pick a few sample points along the curve, these black points, and measure their location in space. Those values are my discrete data, and they really tell me nothing about the curve except for the fact that it passes through those few points. If I want to interpolate, well, there are a lot of different ways I could do it. I could try to find a lot of different curves, continuous curves, that pass through those sampled points. I may not recover the curve that I started with, but I do get a continuous curve that agrees with those measurements. Right? And that's kind of the right perspective to think about. You have taken measurements of a continuous object, and all the calculations, even if they're not exact, should at least agree with the measurements that you know. So what does this mean for differential forms? How do we talk about discretization and interpolation? Well, the really, really key idea behind discrete exterior calculus is that we're going to discretize differential forms by doing something that we already know how to do. We're going to integrate the differential forms. If it's a differential k form, we're going to integrate it over all oriented k simplices of our mesh and just get a single value per mesh element. This discretization process, if you want a fancy name for it, is known as the Dirac map. It's a linear map from our continuous object to the discrete object. Interpolation goes, again, the other way. So we have these measurements of our differential form. We know something about them. We don't know everything about them, but we know something about them. How do we recover some continuous differential form that agrees with our measurements? Well, what we'll see is that we can interpolate them using what are known as Whitney bases. So one of those is depicted for a one form on a triangle in the bottom right. Okay. Once we have all these operations, it becomes pretty easy to implement algorithms. We know how to take continuous data, to discretize it, take that discrete data, compute with it, take the discrete results and interpolate it so that, for instance, we can look at it on the screen. We can see what it looks like. Okay, So let's step through this process. Right? So how do we discretize? Right? How do we approximate a differential form with a finite amount of information? So imagine I have this one form in the plane. What would you do if you said, okay, I have this one form that's defined at every single point in the entire plane, 
or maybe every point inside this rectangular region, how could you capture that differential form with a finite amount of information? What's the most natural thing to do? Okay, well, I already kind of gave away what we're going to do, but something that's maybe more natural, the thing that comes to mind first is to say, I don't know, why don't I just pick some set of points, some finite set of points, and I'll just read off the value of this differential form at each of those points. Okay, well, certainly we've succeeded at discretizing the differential form. We've taken a continuous object, and we now have a finite amount of information, but just discretizing is not enough. Right? Once we have this finite amount of information, we still need to be able to compute with it. We need to be able to answer questions about it. Right? So for instance, if we wanted to take the exterior derivative now of this sample data, what would we do? Maybe, maybe there's something you could do here. But generally speaking, this discretization doesn't really have enough structure to say much interesting about the original differential form. We can't really do computation on this data. So here's what we're going to do instead. We take the same continuous differential form, this one form, and we put down a mesh over the domain. Okay, so this is an oriented simplicial two complex. Because this is a differential one form, we know that we can integrate it along one dimensional curves. Which curves do we have in this mesh? Well, we have the edges of the mesh, the oriented edges. And so if we integrate the differential form along each of these edges, we get a number per oriented edge. Okay, and that's all a discrete differential one form is. It's a number per edge of a mesh. Or more generally, we integrate differential k-forms over k-simplices to get a discrete differential k-form. Now, why is that any better than doing a point sampling? Well, we'll see in more detail, right, that this still doesn't tell us everything about the original differential form, but it is enough to formulate and solve equations. We can do things like take the exterior derivative or take the Hodge star. Right? Once we can do that, we're rolling. We can build up those more complicated operators. So. In a little more detail, let's say that omega is a differential k-form of any degree on Rn, and k is an oriented simplicial complex. Okay? Then for each oriented k-simplex in sigma, the corresponding value of our discrete k-form is this. It's I integrate over sigma omega. Right? And you can see that the degree of the form has to match up with the degree of the simplex. Once we've done all those integrals, we essentially just have a big long list, one value per k simplex. The map taking us from our continuous form omega to our discrete form omega hat is called the discretization map or sometimes called the Dirac map. Okay, so the key idea here is simply that discretization just means integrate a k form over all the k simplices. The result is a list of values. Let's look at some specific cases. So we'll start with zero forms. Suppose we have a zero form phi. What was a zero form? What did that mean? Well, a differential zero form means I just have a scalar value at every point in space. I have a scalar function. OK, so what does it mean to integrate a differential zero form over a zero simplex or vertex? a little bit of a degenerate case. All that means is we just want to grab the value of the function at the location of the vertex. So for example, if we have a function phi of xy equals x squared plus y squared plus cosine 4x plus y, nothing special about this function, just some example, and we have a point p at the location 1, negative 1, OK? How do we integrate phi over v? Well, we just evaluate phi at the location p of v, and we get, in this case, 1 plus 1 plus cosine of 0 is equal to 3, some number. Right? And then we can repeat that at every vertex of our mesh, and we get a number for every vertex. This 
sounds like the thing we said we didn't want to do. We said, we're not just going to sample our differential forms at points. We're going to do something more interesting, right? Well, in the case of zero forms, that's kind of all we can do. We can just grab sample values at vertices. But we'll see it gets a lot more interesting. So in particular, let's say we have a one form alpha in the plane. Question, how do we integrate it over an edge E? What does that mean geometrically to integrate a one form over an edge? Okay, well, the important, very important intuition here is that this integral is basically telling us how much does the one form line up with the edge, or how much does the edge line up with the one form? Right? How strongly is alpha flowing along the edge? This is sometimes called the circulation of alpha along the edge. More precisely, what we can do is just like any other curve, we compute the unit tangent to the edge. In this case, this tangent points the same direction at every point, t. We then apply alpha to t, giving us a function alpha of t. Right, So t is the same at every point, but alpha might be varying. So alpha of t is a scalar function along the edge. And then we just integrate this scalar function over the edge. Right? So we say, the integral of alpha over e is the integral from 0 to the length of the edge L of alpha of t ds. Right? Integrate with respect to arc length. And the result is this total circulation. By the way, in general, this one form alpha could come from anywhere. It could be some very complicated expression, or it could come from some measured data. So how do you compute the integral? The answer is you don't do all that stuff that you learned in your calculus class. This whole idea of computing integrals in closed form by hand is a very, very uh, rare thing to do. Only in very special cases does anybody do that kind of integral. What's far more common is to compute a numerical approximation of the integral. So you can, for instance, just sample this function, alpha of t, along the edge and add up or average the results, multiply by the length of the edge. Okay? So, in practice, very rare to integrate. Also, by the way, pretty, pretty rare to actually come up with discrete one-form values by doing this kind of integration. So what we're going to see is, more often, if we have discrete one-form or two-form or three-form values, those actually come from starting out with just some ordinary values on vertices and applying some of our operators. And we'll see that as we move along. But to stick with this example, let's say that we have a one form in the plane, alpha equals xy dx minus x squared dy. And we have an edge with endpoints p0 equals minus 1, 2, and p1 equals 3, 1. OK, so now let's really try this out. What is the integral? of alpha along E. How strongly is alpha flowing along this edge? Well, let's just do this step by step as we described on the previous slide. So first, we can compute the unit tangent along the edge. To do that, let's, in fact, first compute the length. So we just take the difference of the two endpoints, take the norm, and find that the length is, OK, square root of 17. Then we divide the difference, p1 minus p0, over the length, and we get 4, 1, or 4 minus 1 over root 17. Okay, nothing special about these values. Hence, if we evaluate alpha on t at any point, we get 4xy plus x squared over root 17. How did I get that value? Well, what I did is I applied the one form alpha, written at the top of the slide, to the vector t. The x component of that vector is 4 over root 17, so I multiply that by xy. And the y component of the vector is minus 1 over root 17, so I multiply that by minus x squared. 
and add them up. Okay. Now we need to integrate. So how do we do that? First, we need to remember we should integrate with respect to arc length. We should move along the curve at unit speed and add up the values of alpha t. Okay. So this parameterization we can write as p of s is equal to p naught, the first endpoint, plus s over length, our parameter divided by the total length of the edge, times p1 minus p0. So p1 minus p0 over l is a unit vector along the edge. As s increases, we move along the edge until we get to the full length l. Okay. So if we now just plug this in and do an ordinary integral, right, we're going to integrate from 0 to l alpha of t at the point p of s. Right? What is the value of the function for any parameter s? If we just make those substitutions, we get an integral 7 over 17, integral from 0 to l, 4s minus l ds, and by the time you've worked that out, you find that the answer is 7. Okay, there's nothing meaningful about the final numerical value here. The point of this is just to see how concretely you would integrate a differential one form over an edge. By the way, we made a sort of arbitrary choice here. Right? We said that t is equal to p1 minus p0 over l. Why not let t be p0 minus p1 over l, or what, what would happen in that case? Okay, and that leads to a very, very important concept about integrating differential forms or discretizing differential forms. You know, we've been saying all along, oh, it's very important that we have an oriented simplicial complex, that if we have an edge, we know which way it points. Okay, forgetting differential forms for a moment, why is it useful in life to keep track of an orientation? Well, one reason is that when you're communicating quantities, sometimes quantities have a natural sign associated with them. So for instance, if I asked you, what is the change in elevation as I go from Death Valley to Mount Everest? Well, Death Valley is a very low point on the Earth, Mount Everest is very high, and so you might say, oh, it's 8,934 meters. Okay. If I ask you the complementary question, what is the elevation change as I go from Mount Everest to Death Valley? Well, a useful answer is to say it's not just that same number, but it's minus 8,934 meters. That tells me something very important. I decreased in elevation going from the mountain to the valley. I increased going from the valley to the mountain. Okay? And we can relate this directly to integration or the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I can think of this quantity on the left as the integral from Death Valley to Mount Everest of the infinitesimal change in elevation. As I take each little footstep, am I going up a little bit in elevation or down a little bit in elevation? Likewise, I could think of the quantity on the right as the integral from B to A, from Mount Everest to Death Valley, of the incremental change. Am I going up or down as I take this path? Okay. And what I know is after taking all those steps from the valley up to the mountain, the final change has to be just the difference between where I ended up and where I started. Phi of B minus Phi of A. The elevation at the top of the mountain minus the elevation at the bottom of the valley. Well, just algebraically, that's the same as minus phi of A minus phi of B. Oh, and that's minus the integral on the right. Okay? So really just trying to emphasize this point that when I reverse the direction of an integral, it reverses the sign of the quantity. And this is, by the way, a very common source of error, let's say, when you're writing code. You don't properly take into account the orientation of your edge or your simplex, and you get kind of weird garbage results. Right? Very important to keep in mind. Let's look at an example of discretizing a one form over kind of a whole mesh. So in particular, let's say we have the unit square is our domain, and we have coordinates x, y. Let's say that k is this particular oriented simplicial complex, and let's say that omega equal 2 dx is our differential one form. Okay, how do we discretize omega onto k? Well, we integrate it over each edge. So to get 
omega hat 1, the value of our discrete differential one form on the edge E1. We integrate omega, our continuous differential form, over edge E1. What does that mean? Well, we just need to plug the unit tangent of that edge into omega. The unit tangent in this case is just the unit vector in the horizontal direction, partial, partial x. Okay. Omega is 2 dx, so 2 dx of partial, partial dx is just 2. So we integrate 2 from 0 to 1, and guess what? We get 2. Okay. Similarly, if we want the value of omega hat 2, the value on edge e2, we integrate omega along e2, we get omega of partial partial y. Because omega is just 2 dx, there's no dy component, we just get 0. Okay, and for omega 3, we can do it again. We integrate omega along edge 3. Now it's a little more interesting. We apply omega to a unit vector pointing to the upper right. 1 over root 2 partial partial x plus partial partial y. Omega is going to extract the x component of this vector and multiply it by 2. So we get the integral from 0 to the length of the edge, root 2, of 2 over root 2 dl, which is equal to 2, and so on. Okay, so hopefully this gives a sense of how we start to build up a list of values. We start to build up more and more information about this differential one form by kind of querying it over these different edges. Question, why is it that we ended up with the same value for omega hat 1 and omega hat 3. This seems maybe a little counterintuitive. If we look at these two edges, E1 and E3, E3 looks quite a bit longer than E1. So what, what's going on here? Why is the integral not bigger for omega hat 3? Okay. Well, if you've been following along, you kind of get the idea that omega is not capturing just the length of this edge, right? That's not what we're measuring here. What we're measuring here is the extent of that edge along the x direction. And since both E1 and E3 go from the left side of the square to the right side of the square, the integral of omega is going to be the same. Okay? Important concept to understand. Let's now think about something even more interesting. How do we integrate a differential two form over triangles in our mesh. So let's say we have a two form omega now in R3, and we have this triangle T also floating in R3. What does it mean to integrate omega over T? Well, intuitively, again, that captures how well T is lined up with this two form. The two form is kind of a little oriented plane at each point that has a magnitude. Right? T is sitting in some plane. How much do those agree? So to capture this quantitatively, we can follow a similar recipe to what we did with one form. Rather than just computing one tangent, we're now going to compute a orthonormal basis, T1, T2, for the triangle. We can then apply our differential form omega to these two vectors to get a function omega of T1, T2. Right? Whenever we apply a k form to k vectors, we get a number at each point. And then we can just integrate this scalar function over the triangle. Now this is no different from ordinary integration. We have a function on the triangle, we integrate it up. This value that we get out from the integral encodes how well the triangle lines up with the two form on average times the area of the triangle. Okay, And this is also a really important concept. The area of the triangle factors in here. What we're getting is an integrated quantity. So the bigger the triangle is, the bigger this value is. Okay, We're not getting a pointwise quantity. You could also ask how much it lines up on average. Well, for that, you'd have to divide this integral by the area of the triangle. Again, it's very rare to compute these kinds of integrals explicitly. Right? We're not going to work with special closed form functions that you might have learned in calculus, but rather you just do a numerical integral. Maybe you pick some random sample points, you evaluate the value of the function at these points, take the average, multiply by the triangle area. Okay. Important question. We just talked about how important orientation is. 
What in this case determines the orientation of the triangle T? So when we introduced the idea of an oriented simplicial complex, we had this kind of abstract way of talking about orientation. We talked about whether the vertices were an even or odd permutation of some canonical ordering. Okay, but here there's a much more geometric notion of orientation that really factors into our integration process. We chose this basis T1, T2, and here I've drawn it in a particular way. If we were to flip those two vectors, call t1, t2, and t2, t1, what's going to happen here? Well, omega is measuring the oriented area of t1, t2. So if we swap the order, we're going to get the opposite orientation. We're going to get minus the integral that we just computed. Okay. So in general, reversing the orientation of a simplex will reverse the sign of the integral. If we have a discrete one form alpha, then for each edge ij, alpha ij equals minus alpha ji. If we integrate from i to j, we get the opposite of integrating from j to i. If we instead have a two form beta, okay, we just talked about this, what do you think the relationship is between beta ijk and beta jki? Okay, well maybe you have to stop and think for a moment. Is jki an even or odd permutation of ijk? Well, it turns out to be an even permutation. Okay, so if we compute these two vectors, t1 and t2, by taking the second vertex minus the first vertex, and then the third vertex minus the first vertex, we're going to get vectors that, well, they're not the same, right? j minus i and k minus i, that's one set of vectors. k minus j, i minus j, that's another set of vectors, right? But they're going to have the same orientation. Okay? If we instead have beta j i k and beta k i j, what do you think happens to these values? Well, now the sign flips. Right? K i j is an odd permutation of j i k. I have to do an odd number of swaps. And so when I go to compute t1 and t2 from the first, second, and third vertices, I get a flip. Okay. What's the rule in general? We did one forms, we did two forms. Well, in general, discrete k form values change sign under odd permutation. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Hopefully it does. That's also what we said about oriented k simplices. Okay, so we understand this idea of integrating differential k forms over k simplices, and we already have a pretty good handle on the idea of discrete differential forms. But just to say it directly, okay, a discrete differential k-form is abstractly just any assignment of a value to each oriented k-simplex. So, for instance, on a two-dimensional mesh, an assignment of a value to each vertex gives us a discrete zero-form, a value per oriented edge is a discrete one-form, and values at faces are discrete two-forms. Okay? Conceptually, these values represent integrated k-form, but in practice, they almost never come from directly integrating a continuous form. So more typically, we might start out with some values at vertices, like samples of some function, and then these one forms and two forms and so forth will arise from applying different operators, like the discrete exterior derivative, to the values at vertices. And we're going to talk about those operators in our next lecture. Okay, so abstractly, we just associate values to k simplices. When it comes to computation, it's helpful to do this in kind of an orderly way. So one thing we can do is encode a discrete differential k form as a column vector with one entry for every k simplex in our mesh. So a simple example is we have a discrete zero form meaning a value per vertex, well, we can encode that as a vector with the same number of entries as the number of vertices. To use this representation, we first have to pick some ordering of the vertices. Right? Assign a unique index between one and number of vertices to each 
zero simplex, or more generally, to each k simplex. The ordering of these indices doesn't matter. Pick, pick it however you like. We just need some way to put the elements of the mesh into correspondence with the entries of the vector. One small comment is that you should be careful in a lot of programming languages, indices might start from zero rather than one. Okay, but otherwise the concept's the same. So, for instance, a discrete differential one form is a value per edge of an oriented simplicial complex. To encode these values in a column vector, we must assign a unique index to each edge of our complex. Okay, and then to build our vector representing the discrete differential form, we just go to each edge, grab its index, grab the value, put that value in that entry of the vector. Okay. One thing we always need to be careful about is that if we ever, for some reason, change the orientation of an edge, we must also negate the value in the vector. And if we think of the edge as now pointing the other way, then had we integrated a continuous one form along that edge, right, the sign would flip if we reversed the direction of the integral. Same idea for discrete two forms. Okay. We have values on every triangle, every oriented triangle. We put an index on every triangle, and then we can fill out a vector with those values. As before, changing the orientation of a triangle, so permuting its indices in an odd way, will reverse the sign of the corresponding entry. So when we first introduced k-forms in the continuous setting, we had this whole idea of duality, right? We have k-vectors, which are things that get measured, and k-forms, which are the things that do the measurement. In the discrete setting, we can capture the same idea by the notion of chains and co-chains. So k-chains we'll talk about in just a second, and k cochains are essentially what we've already described, these discrete differential k forms. Okay, So what is a simplicial chain? Right? What is the thing that's getting measured? Well, one way we can think about this is we imagine that every simplex, every k simplex in our complex, is associated with its own basis vector. Right? So I have sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, if I'm talking about the, the two simplices in this triangle mesh. And you can imagine that I take linear combinations of these simplices. So if I just say, okay, my linear combination is zero, I have zero times all of these, you know, add them up, then I'm not specifying any region of the mesh. If I instead take some sum, sigma three plus sigma four plus sigma six and so on, okay, we didn't ever define what it means to take a sum of simplices. This doesn't make sense in any you know, way that we already understand. In this context, in this context of chains, we're simply saying that, oh yeah, sigma three belongs to this set, sigma four belongs to this set, and so forth. Okay, but we can be more general about this and take linear combinations that don't just have coefficients of zero or one, right, not just in or out. So, so what might that mean, or what, what kind of geometric interpretation could you give to such a sum? Let's say I had two sigma three plus sigma four plus sigma six. Or what if you had negative coefficients? Well, if these were, let's say, integers, I could say that kind of means I have n copies of that simplex. So for instance, if I have sigma three plus three sigma five plus sigma eight, that might mean I have one copy of sigma three, one copy of sigma eight, and three copies of sigma five. Or if I have a minus sign, right, if I had minus sigma three, that would mean I'm reversing the orientation. So I'm really taking linear combinations of oriented k simplices. Okay? So hopefully that, that description is good enough. If you want to be more formal about it and you know a little bit of algebra, you can say the chain group CK is the free abelian group generated by the k simplices. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. You probably have the right idea already. Okay. Why is it useful to think about chains in this way? Why is it useful to think about this kind of arithmetic on simplices? Well, here's a kind of nice example. Let's say I start out with a loop, C1, and I can write C1 in this way, or right? I can say C1 is 
E3 minus E12 plus E18 minus E15 plus E6 minus E1. Why, by the way, am I not just adding up all the edges in C1? Why am I adding some and subtracting others? Well, if you look carefully at this diagram, you notice that some of the black arrows are pointing one way, some of them are pointing another way, but I want the loop to go around in one consistent direction. I want it to go around counterclockwise in this case. Okay, I can write another loop in the same way. Let's say C2 is E15 plus E19 minus E17 minus E8 minus E2 minus E6. Okay, and so far I haven't done anything new. I'm using chains to specify regions of the mesh. Now here's the kind of interesting part. I can certainly imagine algebraically adding these two expressions, right? I can go ahead and write C1 plus C2, and it's pretty straightforward what that should mean. Okay, I can take all the terms in C1 and add all the terms in C2. And what happens? So I notice, for instance, I have plus E15 and minus E15, so those cancel. I have plus E6 and minus E6, so those cancel. Okay, so I get this simpler chain, which I guess I could call C3. What does it mean? What, what was the point geometrically? Well, we can just draw the picture of the chain, and what we see is that these two loops kind of got fused together. Right? I took the sum of these two loops where they meet, they have opposite orientations, and so those edges cancel, and we get this one bigger loop made out of the two smaller ones. So this whole setup of chains is going to let us translate ideas and, and things we want to do with, with geometry or topology into statements about linear algebra. And we'll see that a lot more later on in the course, especially when we talk about things like simplicial homology. Okay, But for now, let's just talk about something very basic, which is the boundary of a simplex. Okay, So let's say we have an oriented K simplex, sigma, with vertices VI0 through VIK. What is its boundary? Well, its boundary is going to be an oriented k minus 1 chain. So it's going to be a collection of simplices, of one degree lower. In particular, it's going to be all the simplices we get by considering subsets of size k minus 1. So this strike through means that we've omitted one of the vertices. OK, and it's kind of an alternating sum. We raise minus 1 to the pth power. Okay, maybe a little abstract, but this is actually a really straightforward idea. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a two simplex sigma with vertices v0, v1, v3. Okay, what is its boundary? Its boundary is the one chain v0, v1, plus v1, v3, plus v3, v0. Okay, so here I've swapped the indices around so that there are no minus signs. But geometrically, what does this mean? It just means we get the three edges going around triangle sigma oriented the same way as sigma. Okay, and that's what this minus 1 to the p takes care of. Another example is, let's say we have the one simplex, E, just the edge between v0 and v1. What is its boundary? Okay, we kind of know that the boundary of an edge is the two endpoints, and indeed if we follow through the definition, we get that the boundary is the zero chain boundary of E is V1 minus V0, right? So the minus sign here indicates that we go from V0 to V1 and not the other way around. Okay, final example, let's consider the zero simplex V1. What is its boundary? Well, according to this definition, it would just be the empty set. Okay, so everything works out exactly as we'd expect. The boundary operator can be applied not only to individual simplices, but we can also apply it to a whole chain. If we want the boundary of a region, we can use this kind of linear algebra and manipulate these, these symbols to figure out what the boundary looks like. Okay, so we have the boundary of the sum of a bunch of simplices, or the weighted sum of a bunch of simplices, is just the sum of the linear combination of the boundaries. Okay, so the boundary operator is kind of linear in this way. Example, let's say we have a region on this 
uh, oriented simplicial two complex that's just these two triangles sigma one and sigma two okay what does the boundary look like well the boundary of sigma one is e1 plus e4 plus e3 right? those edges go around the same way that sigma one is oriented and then we add e6 plus e7 minus e4 and so when we simplify this expression we just get e1 plus e6 plus e7 plus e3 as we expect we get a loop that goes around the sort of union of those two triangles okay what if we now take the boundary of this loop what's going to happen well let's just do it one edge at a time so we can say the boundary of one of these edges is v1 minus v0 and then on the next edge we have v4 minus v1 the next edge the boundary is v3 minus v4 and the boundary of the next edge is v0 minus v3 so when we add all of these up we get what what do we get we get nothing right we have pairs of terms that cancel and we just get the empty set okay that's kind of what we expect what would be the boundary points of a loop right there's no endpoints to the loop and what we notice is this idea we had before in the continuous setting, the boundary, the boundary is always empty, we can make really precise using these kind of linear equations, right? Or this, this group operation. Okay. Finally, we can go kind of in the other direction. So we have the boundary, now we have the co-boundary. The co-boundary of an oriented K simplex is the collection of all oriented K plus one simplices that contain sigma and which have the same relative orientation. Again, maybe made clearer by an example. Let's say we have this vertex V inside of this triangle mesh, oriented triangle mesh. Then the co-boundary of this vertex is all of the edges that point toward the vertex V. Question, why do they point in? How did I decide that they should all point toward the vertex and not away? Well, this just goes back to the definition of relative orientation, right? For instance, E1 is the center vertex minus the vertex at the top. So for them to have the same relative orientation, I need to pick the edge such that the head is positive and the tail is negative, okay? Another example, let's say I have the edge E. What is the co-boundary of the edge E? Well, let's look at the definition again. Right, it's all oriented k plus one simplices, so all oriented triangles that contain sigma, in this case, that contain the edge, and which have the same relative orientation. So what we should see is the two edges, sorry, the two triangles touching E, and which have actually opposite orientations, right? Sigma one and sigma two are kind of pointing in different directions, but they share the same orientation with the edge E. By the way, this operation might remind you of something we had for ordinary simplicial complexes, non-oriented simplicial complexes. Right? What would that be? So we had this idea of the simplicial star. Right? The star of an ordinary simplex is the collection of all simplices containing that simplex. So this is kind of a similar idea. The co-boundary operator is a similar notion, but there are two important differences. One is that, of course, the co-boundary operator considers orientation. And two, the co-boundary operator is only giving us simplices of one degree higher, right? I'm only finding K plus one simplices that contain sigma. Whereas the star said any simplex of any degree that contains the original one. Okay? So that's our primal object, simplicial chains. What about the dual object? Well, the dual object is a simplicial co-chain. And just like the right way to think about covectors is as linear maps from vectors to numbers, a simplicial K co-chain is a linear map taking a simplicial K-chain to a number. So if I have a co-chain alpha, and I apply it to a chain, C1 sigma 1 plus dot 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 plus Cn sigma n, then I'm going to spit out a number. In particular, I'm going to spit out the number that I get by just summing 
over all of the simplices, some coefficient alpha i associated with the ith simplex, the ith k simplex, times ci, the coefficient in my chain for that simplex. Okay, so for example, maybe I have a simplicial k cochain alpha that assigns one to every individual two simplex. Right? So if I stick in a chain that's just a single oriented triangle, no matter which one it is, the linear function says the value of the function is equal to one. Let's say I apply that to a chain sigma three plus three sigma five plus sigma eight. Okay, then by linearity, I'm just going to add up one plus three plus one. Okay, or we could write this out in kind of a matrix representation, right? I could encode my linear map from chains to numbers as a row vector, in this case, that's just all ones. And I can encode my chain as a column vector that says how many copies of each simplex I have. Okay, and the application of the linear map is just ordinary matrix multiplication. I take a dot product and again get one plus three plus one equal five. Okay, if you want to be a bit more formal about this, you could say, the cochain group CK is a group of homomorphisms from K chains to the reals. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's perfectly fine. This idea of taking linear combinations and then applying a linear map is exactly the right picture. Okay, so this is all getting pretty abstract. What does this really mean? What does it mean geometrically? So what we are going to do is do exactly what we've been doing this whole lecture and say, okay, we're going to think of this simplicial K cochain as storing for each oriented k simplex, the integral of some differential k form over that simplex. That's where we get these coefficients alpha sub i. Okay, if that's the case, right, if the if the simplicial code chain is storing these little integrals, then what does it mean geometrically to apply this linear map? What does it mean to apply a code chain to a chain? Well, okay, we just said our discrete k-form values, or our cochain values, come from integrating some smooth k-form over each k-simplex. Okay, so let's say we have this simplicial two-complex, we integrate some continuous two-form over each triangle. In some places, the two-form lines up more with the triangle, so we get a bigger value, a darker red color. In some places, the two-form doesn't line up very well with the triangle, so we get a lighter value, a smaller value, right? And now let's say we have a simplicial chain that specifies some region of this mesh, right? some union of triangles. What does it mean to apply alpha hat to C? And so we say alpha hat of C, well, that's going to be alpha hat 3 plus alpha hat 4 plus alpha hat 7 plus alpha hat 8, right? because all of our coefficients in C are just 1s. So we just add up the corresponding values of alpha. What does that mean geometrically? It means, oh, well, that's the same as integrating our original continuous differential form alpha over the union of those triangles. Okay, so this is a lot of words and, and concepts and ideas to just say, oh, if we were to integrate a differential form over each of these little triangles, then sure, if we need the integral over a bigger region, we can just go ahead and add up those little integrals and we get the exact result, right? We're not making any kind of approximation. There's no error, okay? So that's good. It's good to have that interpretation. It kind of grounds us in some connection to differential forms, but it's also useful to take a step back and say, what do we really have, right? We have this motivating picture from exterior calculus, but we can kind of let that fade into the background and just say, you know, at its core, a discrete differential K form is nothing more than an assignment of a number to each oriented k simplex, such that when we change the orientation of the simplex, we negate the numbers. That's really all it is. Okay, and as we go on, we might, by the way, denote the space of discrete differential k-forms as capital omega hat sub k. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about the first direction, discretization, going from something continuous to something discrete. Let's go the other direction. Let's say we have discrete data on our mesh, and we want to construct some continuous differential form. The, the most straightforward reason, by the way, that you would want to do this is to say, oh, I have like values at vertices and I want to visualize them, or I have values on edges and I want to visualize them. How are you going to draw this on your screen? Well, you have to interpolate them somehow. 
Okay, so how does that work? Let's start at the beginning. So let's say we have a discrete differential zero form, which is a really, really fancy way of saying at every vertex of our mesh, we have a number, right? How can we interpolate these numbers or these values across the rest of the mesh? Well, one way is to use the so-called hat functions or Lagrange bases. The Lagrange basis phi sub i associated with vertex i is a function that is linear over each simplex and satisfies this property. So just meaning that at each vertex j, the function takes a value 1 if j is actually the same as vertex i, and 0 otherwise. So a function that looks like this. Okay, that's why we call it a hat function, because it looks like this really cool hat. Okay, so then once we have a basis function associated with a single vertex, we can take linear combinations of these basis functions to do interpolation. Okay, so in particular, let's say we have a discrete zero form, we have a value at every vertex then we can interpolate these values with a function u of x, which is just the sum over all vertices i of the value u sub i stored at i times the hat function phi sub i associated with that vertex. And so we just weight the hat functions by the values at vertices. If a value u sub i gets bigger, then that hat function gets taller. If it gets smaller, that hat function gets shorter. Right? And we say that this function u of x interpolates the data, the u sub i's, because we know by the way we constructed these bases that at the vertex, this function is going to exactly hit the value u sub i. Okay? So the result, by the way, this object u of x is a continuous object. It's an object that has a value at every point x in the entire domain. So we've now gone from a discrete zero form to a continuous zero form. Okay. These hat functions are connected to the barycentric coordinates. So you might remember that any point inside of a K simplex can be expressed as a weighted combination of the vertices where the weights are non-negative and sum to one. These weights are called the barycentric coordinates. So they're plotted here for a triangle. Okay, and then the Lagrange basis for a vertex i is given explicitly by the ith barycentric coordinates inside of each of the triangles touching i. Okay, so just a more explicit way to write it. Okay, so not so hard to interpolate scalar data at vertices. How do we interpolate higher degree discrete differential forms? Well, the trick actually is going to be to come up with a new set of basis functions called the Whitney bases by just taking derivatives of the hat functions, the Lagrange bases. Okay, so in particular, let's say that phi sub i are again the hat functions associated with the vertices of our mesh. Then let's talk about one forms. So the Whitney one forms are differential one forms, continuous differential one forms associated with each oriented edge ij. And we can write these as phi sub ij is defined as phi sub i, so the hat function at vertex i, times d phi sub j, the exterior derivative of the hat function at vertex j, minus phi sub j times d phi i. Okay, what does that look like? It looks something like this. Okay, so you notice that this one form phi sub ij points strongly along the edge ij and it kind of tapers off as we go away from the edge. One thing you can notice, by the way, is that if we write down phi sub ji, we get the same expression but with a sign flipped. Okay, that's nice. If we reverse the orientation of our edge, we get a nice interpolating basis that just points the other direction. Once we have a Whitney basis for each edge, we can interpolate discrete data stored on all the edges by just taking a linear combination. Right? So if we have one form values omega hat on each edge, then we can interpolate them by summing over all edges the one form values, which are just numbers, omega hat ij, times these basis functions, or these basis one forms, phi sub ij. More generally, if we want to interpolate discrete differential k-forms of any degree, can do something similar. 
And so let's say we have an oriented K simplex with vertices I0 through IK. We have a Lagrange basis or a hat function associated with each of these vertices. And so what we're going to do is wedge together the exterior derivative of all but one of these hat functions and then multiply by the remaining hat function. Okay, and then take an alternating sum of those K forms. One question you might ask is, okay, this is some way of interpolating our discrete data, but why this way? I mean, is there anything good about this particular interpolation scheme? So here's a nice fact. Suppose that we start out with a discrete differential k-form, right, a value per oriented k-simplex. We can go ahead and interpolate this data using these Whitney bases. This will give us a continuous differential k-form over the whole mesh. Okay, And then we can immediately go back the other direction. We have a continuous differential form, so we can discretize it. How do we discretize? We integrate our Whitney interpolated data along each k simplex to get a value per k simplex. And what's really nice about these Whitney bases is that we recover the exact same discrete k form. So we could draw it like this. If we start out with this discrete differential form, we interpolate with the Whitney bases, we get a continuous differential form, we can then discretize by integration to get back new values that are exactly the same as the one we started with. This is not something that'll happen in general. If I pick arbitrary functions to interpolate with, there's no reason I would necessarily get this property. Right? So just to kind of make sure we understand what's going on here, what about the other direction? So let's say we start with a continuous differential k-form, we discretize by integrating that k-form over the k-simplices, and then we interpolate by the Whitney forms, by the Whitney bases. Will we also, in this case, get the same continuous k-form that we started with? And if you understand, or if you can get this question, then you really have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on. Okay, and hopefully you realize the answer is no, it doesn't work out in the other direction. Because when we discretize, we're always losing information. We start out with this continuous differential form, it has values everywhere, and we're just getting some information about that differential form. We have a finite number of values that we store on our mesh, right? a finite number of little integrals. Okay, so in summary, today we introduced a really important object for everything that comes next, which is this idea of a discrete differential form. Put very, very simply, a discrete differential k form is just a value, a number, stored on each oriented k simplex. We can think of these values as coming from a process of discretization, so you can imagine that we started with continuous differential k forms, and we integrated those over oriented k simplices in order to get these values. It's not always what actually happens in practice, but that's the right conceptual picture. We can also go the other direction. If we have values stored on our mesh, we can interpolate them to get a continuous differential form. And we did that by taking weighted sums of basis functions, in particular the Whitney basis functions. Okay, so again, in practice, these discrete differential forms almost never come from direct integration. More typically, we're going to start out with some values at vertices, like samples of a function or positions of the vertices of our mesh. And these higher degree forms are going to arise from applying operators like the discrete exterior derivative or the discrete Hodge star, which are going to be the topic of our next lecture. So talk to you then.